Okay, guys, we'll go until my voice goes out. I'm getting excited. It's my second win for a Friday afternoon, so. Oh, this is amazing case too. I know I say that about a lot of cases, but it's because I see a lot of really interesting stuff, so. All right, what do you guys think this is from here? Give me some, some ideas. I can't remember the clinical on this, but I think it was like a um, red to purple nodule on the, the leg, if I recall, of an older adult. Okay, we got a vote for Kaposi sarcoma. Great idea. Infectious granuloma. That's a great idea because the idea that maybe this could be a central focus of necrosis. There's pink stuff in here that looks kind of homogenous and mixed together. And that's a great, a great pickup. And it definitely looks different from the color of the background dermis, which has a lot of elastosis, solar elastosis, but also there is some collagen here and that color looks different from that. Good. Anything else? Okay, we'll go a little closer. Someone thought about epithelioid sarcoma. Bravo, Dr. Moore. That's not what it is, but I love that you thought about it because it had the idea of a central zone of necrosis with a ring of cells around the outside. And I, the goal is that you always think of epithelial sarcoma and be wrong and it not be that. Because the time you don't think of it, that's the time you miss it. And it's so rare, you might see it once in your career. I mean, even as a sarcoma pathologist, I probably only see it once or twice a year, maybe. And sometimes I'll go a year or two without seeing any cases, which always makes me nervous. But I try to think about it all the time and look for it. Someone thought about tuberculosis? Yeah, that'd be possible. Let's go look at what's going on in the outside. What kind of cells are these? So I'm reassured that it's not epithelioid sarcoma because they definitely don't look like the atypical epithelioid cells. Granuloma is still a possibility. They look kind of like histiocytes, but there are some blood vessel lumens in here too. Mixture of lymphs, EOs, histiocytes. So, you know, infection, that's possible. Let's go look in the middle. There are actually some vessels here. And I, I don't have the, unfortunately, I don't have the scan of it or the pick of it handy, but I did actually a vascular stain. And this is a largely composed of a lot of blood vessels, certainly a bunch of mixed inflammation in there, but there are many blood vessels in here. Now, can someone tell me the diagnosis? Because this is the field that you need to make the diagnosis. Once you know what this is and that you're looking for, this is the diagnostic field. Very good. This is bacillary angiomatosis. Well done, Dr. Campbell. Excellent work. These are thankfully quite rare nowadays. Um, this is, I think this is one of only a couple cases that I personally diagnosed in practice in eight years. Um, in the old days before um, when the AIDS epidemic was happening and there was no um, antiretroviral therapy yet, bacillary angiomatosis had become relatively common um, as most of you probably remember, this is caused by Bartonella hensley, the same, and you can also, there's a couple other Bartonella species, I think that can cause it sometimes, maybe Quintana can, I can't remember. Someone can, can type in and correct me, but, but the main one is Bartonella hensley. It's the same organism that causes cat scratch disease. Um, and in people that are severely immunosuppressed, particularly in AIDS patients, it can cause this really dramatic reactive vascular proliferation. So here, this is all a nodule of reactive increased vessels with a bunch of inflammation mixed with it. All this stuff in the center that looks like necrosis is actually fibrin. And fibrin, it, the, this is not always there. It's, uh, some cases are a lot more cellular than this, but this case is kind of interesting because it had a bunch of fibrin. Fibrin and necrosis look quite a lot like each other, and sometimes I can't even tell them apart, okay? So um, I, that's been on my list of things to make a video about for some time about pink, pink homogenous stuff, amyloid, necrosis, collagen, because those things can be hard to tell apart for beginners and even for people that do this a lot. But the key that I was pointing out here, this is the organism. These little hazy, fluffy purple clouds there, 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 here, those are clusters of Bartonella organisms. The individual organisms, even with a, a light microscope and not a scan site, are too small to see. Um, they just show up as these little hazy colonies, but they always have this look like that of a kind of hazy colony. So um, it's a really nice example. And if you people talk about doing the Warthin starry stain to help highlight them, 
Um, in my experience, I, I've seen pictures of some Wharton stories that labs do that look really nice, but I've never seen one of those in real life. I, I feel like most people really struggle to get Wharton story to work the right way. It's super dirty, has lots of background debris. Um, so um, in my, uh, I don't think we don't even offer it in our lab anymore because we don't need it. Because for, for syphilis, we don't do it. We do a spirochete immunostain. If I really needed to help here, I would just send it out for PCR to test for Bartonella. Um, okay, but in this case, I think this looks like a slam dunk and nothing else needed. I don't believe this patient was AIDS patient. I think that they were immune, uh, an older patient that was immune suppressed. I can't remember if it was either immune suppression from their old age or if they actually had, um, if they actually were on immunosuppressive drugs. I, I can't recall the, the situation, but a really nice example. And that is just to remember that that's what you're looking for, those purple colonies. Let's go look at the other piece and see if there's any, anything else over here. And the other take home point to remember about there, those colonies right there, see? With practice, you can tell they just have a very distinct look. And um, with, um, oh, and there's more. There, 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 there. Some cases have a lot of neutrophils, and some cases are a lot more vascular than this and look very much like a pyogenic granuloma, lobulary capillary hemangioma. And if you, um, if you the kind of uh, general pearl is if I see something that I think looks kind of like a PG, a pyogenic granuloma, and then I see like little neutrophil abscesses in the middle of it or something funny about it, I go start hunting around to see if I can find these colonies because they can look, it looks quite a bit like um, PG sometimes. Now this particular case does not, but that's a good take home though. If you see something that looks like a super inflamed PG, you know, PG often has a lot of inflammation on the top, but if you see a bunch of inflammatory stuff down in the middle or something funny about it, then start hunting around to see if it could possibly be this. And sometimes the vessels in vascular angiomatosis can become quite atypical looking. The endothelial cells get very large and revved up. And um, uh, a very well-known soft tissue pathologist once told me that she had gone over some old cases and found, um, found examples from the old days before people really knew about vascular angiomatosis that have been diagnosed as angiosarcoma, misdiagnosed, because they looked so scary and people didn't recognize that it was vascular angiomatosis. It was before the, before the days of the, the AIDS or the early days of the AIDS epidemic when it wasn't recognized yet. So that was a real, and, um, and it, was, uh, it was a very well-known pathologist told me this and the person who had seen it and misdiagnosed it was another in long ago, very, very skilled uh, pathologist in the olden days who really knew what they were doing. So I, I always learn so much when I hear stories about people that are very, very good pathologists and still struggle to recognize something or make a mistake. And the reason to pass those on is not to ever shame those people, but because I think if they made that mistake, then I know I could make that mistake. And that has taught me and that has saved me multiple times in practice. And so I always am so very thankful for my mentors telling me the mistakes they've made and the diagnostic struggles they've had or that others they've known have had. And I try to pass that stuff on to all of you as trainees because I think that that's a really great way to recognize pitfalls and hopefully avoid them, which will keep you out of trouble and also hopefully protect your patients. So I think it's really important that kind of storytelling is important. And that's the stuff that doesn't get put in the books very much. And so I think that these videos and stuff like this are a great way to make sure that that, that kind of lesson gets passed on. Um, and if it saves one patient one day, then it's totally worth it. Okay, bacillary and geomatosis.